It's rare that if I go to a public event that somebody doesn't come in and uh, comment uh, on either Gettysburg or Gods and Generals. And it's, you know, deeply appreciated. Uh, you know, a, a person come up to me and, and make a comment on one of those movies. It's, uh, uh, it's meaningful to me. An excerpt from today's guest, who needs no introduction. Theatrical director Ron Maxwell is here in conversation to kick off our special Gettysburg July 4th weekend. I'll return with Ron's interview right after this break. I'm Robert Child, and this is Point of the Spirit. Summer is a great time for catching up on military history, and my book about the seven Black Medal of Honor recipients of World War II is out now. Immortal Valor chronicles these timeless heroes' life journeys through all the pain and struggle until their ultimate triumphs. I hope you check out the book or audiobook, which is available now in stores and online. Welcome back. Today's guest is an award-winning Hollywood filmmaker, best known for his successful films on the American Civil War. And he had several box office hits before those two films. My interview with Ron Maxwell was taped a couple of years back during the 150th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg, and I started out by asking him about the importance of Gettysburg 150 years later. Well, Rob, this is a question I've had a lot of time to think about, <laughs> and the more I think about it, it it's, uh, it, it's partly a uh, mystery, because uh, why people uh, get attached to different places, different uh, over the years, over the centuries... Um, it, it is a profound question. Uh, other people do it in other cultures, uh, but we, in particular, do it. And and even in traveling to foreign countries uh, who have had longer histories than ours, they even find it curious when they visit America that we're we're so uh, we take such care of of our historic places. Um, <clears throat> you can walk in places of your in Europe where monumental battles have been fought. And there's not even a plaque. There's no. No, no uh, monument or, or open space left where, where such and such uh, thing occurred. Uh, w- w- we do have this particular uh, fondness for uh, for uh, landmarks in our in our history, and perhaps uh, in our lo- in our in our in our few hundred year long history, uh, going back to the colonial era, the the, the one event that uh, where there are pro- perhaps more monuments and more dedicated areas than any other in our history is the, are, are those around the American Civil War. Why is that? Um, I think a few reasons. Um, it, it's, uh, it was a fratricidal war. Uh, there was no uh, them and us. There was just us and us. I think that's one of the reasons. Uh, uh, because it, it, it so profoundly tore the fabric uh, of American society uh, there was so much destruction, so much uh, loss of life, uh, that, and that, and that uh, catastrophe lingered for generations. Uh, if you look at American culture uh, and uh, art and music, uh, you can see a, a change uh, that occurs in the 1890s. It took uh, a, an entire generation to, to grow up, live, and die before the national mood seems to have changed. Uh, certainly individual lives may have rebounded quicker than that, but in terms of the national, uh, uh, f- the national culture, the national family, it was an entire generation. So it, it's hard to, uh, to uh, overestimate the damage, the catastrophic nature of that war uh, that it had on the, on the generation that lived through it. Uh, it more recently, uh, scholars are uh, revising upwards the amount, the number of uh, war casualties, the number of dead, the number of wounded, the number of civilians uh, who were uh, killed, uh, maimed, dispossessed. It was such a magnitude of tragedy that it's, uh, we, we don't really get our arms around it. Um, and so I think uh, of, of, all the, of all the conflicts and of all the uh, events in American history, the highs and the lows, the Civil War, Civil War stands out still. Even with the advance of time, even with with the greater distance we 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 get from it. Look, I've been working on my Civil War movies for uh, more than twenty years. Uh, uh, 
more than 25 years, actually. So a big chunk of my life has been uh, been in, in, involved in, in, in researching these stories, telling these stories. And uh, w when I look around, I see a greater interest now than even when I uh, started uh, in the in, in the early 19 uh, late 1970s. Um, so uh, I think it's because of the uh, the initial catastrophic nature of the war, the fact that it was us and us, the fact also that it was fought in our own backyards. Uh, it wasn't fought in some faraway country, some faraway place, uh, where only the soldiers went and some returned and some didn't. This was fought here. Uh, I live in, uh, in, in, in Rappahannock County, Virginia. Uh, you look in any direction, you, you'll find a, a crossroads uh, where this army moved north or this army moved south. Uh, not far in adjoining counties, major battles of the Civil War were fought. Uh, there's a couple of houses uh, uh, right down the street from where I live that were used as hospitals by both armies moving south, moving north. Um, Mosby's Raiders moved through here. So uh, there's almost nowhere you can go which wasn't touched by, by the war. Um, also, I think the, uh, the reasons why the war was fought still resonate. Um, uh, the issue of race is still very much in our consciousness as a people. We, uh, we're still trying to work this out, uh, still trying to strive to that perfection that Martin Luther King uh, uh, articulated, being able to look at to at one another, regardless of our racial and ethnic background, to be able to look at one another and see the content of our, of the, of our character and look beyond uh, the superfice of what we see when we meet people, uh, to find our common humanity. Uh, it's a different place here, certainly, than it was in the 1860s or even the 1960s when I grew up. But that striving for perfection, uh, that's a road we're on, and so Americans are uh, kind of acutely aware of this and sensitive to these issues. Uh, and that's something that the Civil War, the cauldron of the Civil War, encompasses in, in, the, in, the, um, in the issue of slavery and the abolition of slavery, the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, another thing that was uh, uh, another issue of the war uh, was where does sovereignty uh, lie? Does, it, does the principal sovereignty lie in the individual? Uh, does it lie in the community? Does it lie within a state? Does it lie in the national uh, governance? Um, uh, th these were issues that were argued uh, uh, by the founding generation. Uh, if you read uh, all the, the arguments uh, in the, uh, that were conducted in the Constitutional Convention, uh, should we have a unitary presidency? Should there be three people making up the presidency? Uh, the founding generation was concerned about the devolution of power. They didn't want to see a king. We fought a revolution to get rid of king and hereditary aristocracy. Uh, they were looking for a more democratic way to share power. Uh, they feared concentrated power. Uh, so these were embodied in the Constitution, uh, the protections against uh, concentrated power, the uh, checks and balances. They were also uh, the further protections in the Bill of Rights. And so when you had uh, these uh, various issues uh, moving through the 1840s, 1850s, uh, could they have been in, uh, resolved amicably, peaceably? Uh, probably yes. I mean, uh, all, histor all history has cross crossroads and, and diverging points when you could have taken this path or taken that path. And the circumstances and the, and the players in the 1840s, 1850s, and 1860s led uh, to war. Uh, I don't think it was inevitable, but it led to war. Uh, and uh, the consequences were dire. Uh, but so, so one of the issues uh, that is articulated, certainly in the war starts, uh, was the issue of where does power lie? And the, uh, those who made up the Confederate states that seceded uh, would have argued in what we now call, and they call two states' rights, that the power, the political power uh, was within the state governments and that the state governments voluntarily came together to form a union and that they could voluntarily leave. This was the argument for secession. Um, and then the unionists uh, believed that, uh, more or less, that the um, ultimate power resided in a federal government and that states could no longer voluntarily leave. That was probably, I'm oversimplifying, the, but it's the, the, the original conflict that was, uh, and the spark was Fort Sumter. And those issues are still with us. We still argue every day 
about uh, whether we resolve a certain issue at the federal level or whether it should be left to the states, or even whether it should be left within the state with it to the communities. Uh, and we're constantly having these arguments about uh, zoning, about private property, about uh, roads, about who pays for things. Uh, every single issue it goes back to the same issues that were fought over the Civil War. So I think for all these reasons, for historic reasons, for political reasons, for cultural reasons, the Civil War seems to be the cauldron where all these issues are con concentrated. Uh, and, uh, and then finally, from a filmmaker's point of view and from a storyteller's point of view, when you look at the Civil War, you find these incredible characters, these incredible people. Uh, whether they were wearing blue, whether they were wearing gray, whether they were civilians, whether they were black, whether they were white. They're human, but at the same time, they're almost larger than life. And so many of these people on their own are, become worthy subjects for novels, history, and for movies. So I have no doubt that, uh, that for m many generations to come, uh, as long as there's an America, filmmakers will be making movies about the American Civil War. I hope you're enjoying this special episode and interview with Ron Maxwell. This episode kicks off our two-part narrative special, Gettysburg, Voices from the Front, which will release over this July 4th weekend. It is late May, 1863, and Confederate President Jefferson Davis has called a war council at the White House of the Confederacy in Richmond. In the third week of May, I convened my cabinet along with my commander of the Army of Northern Virginia, General Lee, to weigh matters of the gravest concern. I hope you can join us for Gettysburg, Voices from the Front. Now let's return to my conversation with Ron Maxwell, where I asked him how he became interested in Gettysburg. Well, uh, I, I respond to a good story, uh, uh, intuitively. And um, so I wasn't, back in the 1970s, I wasn't at all looking to do a movie on the Civil War. That, that uh, wasn't where I was at. I was uh, I just responding to uh, uh, various uh, input and, uh, and various uh, stimuli. Uh, and, and, uh, like any filmmaker, oh, I want to tell this story, I want to tell that story, I want to visit this place, I want to explore this world, I want to live in this place. Uh, and um, my uh, uh, former wife, uh, uh, Wife number two, <laughs> uh, uh, Victoria, um, thought I might like to read this book called The Killer Angels. Uh, I think I read it in uh, 77 uh, and um, around there. And um, I knew uh, before I was halfway through the book that it was just a great read, great characters, great story. And uh, I just excited me as a filmmaker and uh, by the time I finished it uh, I got in touch with my agent uh, uh, and started uh, to, to acquire the rights. That was 78. So in 78 I acquired the rights to the book and met Michael Shara and started the long journey that was took 15 years from the time I, I read it to the time it became a motion picture. Michael um, uh, traveled through uh, Gettysburg when his kids were uh, young and that visit made an impression on him. Uh, and that visit is what prompted him to then research the battle and write that novel. Um, there's really nothing like it in, in the rest of his uh, artistic output. Uh, <clears throat> but it was, um, uh, when it came out, uh, even though it, it won uh, a Pulitzer Prize for fiction. It didn't sell that well, and he found that uh, the response to it, even though it, it, it did it, what it did win awards, it was not commercially uh, uh, what he'd expected. So it was it was a disappointment for him in that sense. Uh, <clears throat> the timing maybe didn't work for him because when it came out uh, in the mid '70s, uh, the country was fresh out of the uh, Vietnam War, and uh, people just didn't had enough of, of uh, war. I think it's like anything else with a uh, movie, timing of a movie or a book, timing, timing, timing. Uh, but, he did, but it was recognized uh, for its literary merit. Um, and then uh, during his lifetime, uh, he uh, never got additional kind of credit for the, uh, I think, the uh, quality of the writer that, that he is. 
He died in 88, so he didn't even live to see uh, this uh, Killer Angels turn into the motion picture Gettysburg. We uh, developed a very close friendship over the years. Um, he uh, loved to sit around the piano and sing, uh, as I do. And we would just open up the scores and uh, get a good uh, sight reader and, uh, and go through, uh, you name it, opera, <laughs> operetta, musical comedy. Uh, uh, but he had, um, uh, he had had a terrible uh, automobile accident uh, uh, sometime in the uh, in the, uh, the years start to blur, but uh, before I had met him, and that impaired his ability to write. Um, so he, uh, after that accident, uh, creative writing for him became much more difficult than it was before, uh, and it, uh, he found it deeply, uh, f deeply frustrating because he had so many more stories he wanted to tell. And uh, he left us in 88, so uh, he never got to see uh, the movie, and uh, that was, uh, it looked, at that point, one wondered whether it would ever be made. Um, so uh, he, uh, but it was, he was a wonderful friend, and um, uh, we had many, many uh, great evenings around the piano. Both Gettysburg and Goddess and Generals have a uh, very strong life in uh, home video. Uh, and in uh, all the aftermarkets, uh, broadcast television. They have found an audience and con and that, that continues to renew itself um, and uh, witnessed by uh, a year and a half, two years ago, uh, Warner Brothers released the director's cuts of both movies. There actually was a longer version than the Gettysburg movie. It was almost 18 minutes longer, which even I had forgotten. So when they said, you know, we have a longer version we want to release as a director's cut, I said, there is no longer version. <laughs> and then I was corrected when they showed me that, in fact, there was one that I'd forgotten about. And that was refinished uh, almost two years ago, remixed and, re and, and recolored and, and, and uh, uh, re released along with Gods and Generals. In the case of Gods and Generals, uh, there was, in fact, an hour more of material we added, re-edited, the whole film and, and, and restored that to its original. Uh, and those films uh, just play and play in, in the home video market. So it's, uh, it's been very gratifying that uh, the audience keeps uh, discovering and rediscovers those movies. Making motion pictures is very challenging. Getting them financed is very challenging. And so uh, it's, in a sense, although it's never easy, and I can't even use the word easy, it's not applicable, but it's easier. <laughs> to uh, get a film financed if you've done similar f films before. Uh, the financiers, the people who invest in movies, it's a lot of money, it's millions of dollars, um, can see that you have a track record. So uh, if you look at uh, any filmmakers making feature films, they are kind of working in, a, in an area, more or less. Uh, uh, I'm endlessly uh, admiring of somebody like Ang Lee, who just, uh, he's not confined by genre, he just is so, uh, Catholic in his tastes and the films that he's able to do. Um, and I, like most filmmakers, want to do all sorts of movies. I have interests that range across a wide range of topic and interests. But when it comes to getting them financed, uh, people like to, uh, are, are comfortable if you stay in an area where they think you've been successful. Um, and so even though I have projects, uh, Joan of Arc project I've been working on for more than 20 years, uh, a uh, project on the French Revolution, all sorts of other projects I have and developed, have screenplays that have, I've been very close to getting financed at various points over the last 20 plus years. Um, uh, the ones that get made are the Civil War movies uh, because of Gettysburg and then Gods and Generals. So uh, I'm very happy that, uh, that any of these get made because it's tough to make a, a historical motion picture uh, about any time, any period for any filmmaker. And the Copperhead was uh, 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 of great interest to me because, it, for me, it, it was going into an entirely new area. If, um, if, the, um, uh, if both uh, uh, Gettysburg and uh, Gods and Generals explored uh, uh, why people, why good people fight, um, Copperhead explores why good people choose not to fight. Which is, which is another compelling question. And the Copperhead is about uh, a man who, uh, <coughs> who uh, doesn't think it's a good idea to have a fratricidal war over these issues. He believes that these issues uh, that the war is fought over, 
can be solved nonviolently. And for that reason, uh, for his position, he is metaphorically tarred and feathered and uh, ostracized from his community, which is a northern community. Uh, it, the story takes place in upstate New York in 1862. So this is a very, a very intriguing for, for me to, uh, to look at the war through the lens of somebody who was not for it. Uh, you could find it probably a story uh, that takes place in the South, uh, uh, a person who was living in, the, in one of the southern states who was not in favor of secession, who was not in favor of a, of a violent conflict over these issues. And that would be uh, equally interesting to, uh, to explore. <clears throat> so when I came across this story, I found it very intriguing because it was new ground for me to explore and uh, to look at the war through an entirely different lens. Um, uh, and the character of Abner Beach, who is the principal character in Copperhead, uh, is not a pacifist in the sense uh, of a Quaker or a Mennonite being opposed to any war, any time, any place. He chooses uh, uh, this uh, to take a political position that this particular war is wrong to fight. And uh, for this position, uh, he is uh, ostracized by his community, which is completely invested in the northern aims of the war which by 1862 were certainly to preserve the Union, uh, but, but in the fall of 1862 becomes the, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation is issued and it becomes also to, uh, to free the slaves and abolish slavery. Uh, he is n not in favor of slavery. Uh, he is uh, in favor of preserving the Union. Uh, so he's not opposed to the, to the war aims. He just doesn't think it's worth having a war over, that there are specific means of solving these problems. So he's an intriguing character uh, that uh, Harold Frederick wrote when he wrote this novel in the, eight, uh, in, the late, in the late 1890s. Harold Frederick was a young man during the war, so he, he writes about things that uh, he might, might have witnessed. It's a work of fiction, but it rings very true to, uh, the, to time and place. And, and for me, it was breaking new ground. It was looking at the issues in, a, in an entirely new light. And it explores the, uh, the issue of dissent and um, the, the cost of dissent, especially during war when you're, everybody's at a fever pitch. The politics are extreme. Um, people are very opinionated and the stakes are literally life and death. I'd like to thank Ron Maxwell for being a part of Point of the Spear. This episode kicks off our two-part narrative special, Gettysburg, Voices from the Front which releases over this July 4th weekend. And next week, be sure to join us for New York Times best-selling author Mark Greeny, who's out with a new book, Armored. This is a book about uh, private military corporations and um, that sort of thing. Uh, very, very serious work these, these men and women do. I, I've trained around a lot of these people in, in my research, and doing that, you see the humor and you see the kind of the gallows humor that, that helps people get through the day. That's next time. And be sure to check out our Point of the Spear YouTube channel with bonus video material plus full military history documentaries. There's tons to explore, and I hope you check it out. I'm Robert Child, and this has been Point of the Spear. Music licensed from audioblocks.com. Point of the Spear is produced by RSC Media Group.